many more things under his sleeve, so hopefully we get to hear the whole medley. Welcome, Erki. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I was informed in time that it's not, a, it's not going to be an announced public lecture, so I did my best not to write anything. So just um, what I'm just plan simply trying to do is to give you an idea about the couple of fields that I've been working on during these, <clears throat> let's say, past, maybe past 15 years or so. And um, I think it w will get clear quite soon that I uh, was one of those people who never probably could make, could, was able to make very strict decisions about concentrating on just one kind of things and throwing all the others aside. So I, um, for years I found myself trying to push along uh, various lines sometimes and actually more and more often interlocking, meeting each other, but still um, applying uh, quite a few different media for these for this purposes. So I'll um, try to give you a couple of glimpses of, of that, that kind of activity I have been involved with um, in these past few years. So uh, to say a couple of words about my background, which I think is always, always useful to, to help you understand some of these things. Um, on the one hand, uh, it's in, in cultural history, studies in, in cultural history and art history, actually quite a long, long time ago already. Um, uh, but uh, during those years at the university uh, in Finland, I was very actively involved with the different issues around uh, audiovisual culture at that time. So actually starting from film, I was one of those film buffs who uh, spent maybe about six nights a week uh, in the cinema in the 70s in Finland, which was a wonderful time of seeing uh, films from both East and uh, West. So I, I could probably say that by the time I was about 17 or 18, I had a fairly good education in, in uh, classical cinema. And uh, actually one really memorable event uh, took place, uh, I think when I was probably about 15 or 16, uh, also back in Finland, um, I somehow got uh, uh, aware about, about um, a very special screening which was supposed to take place in the city, the fairly small city in which I was living at that time. Um, an old French person, old man, so I actually still remember his features, um, was touring with a very extraordinary film show, uh, which actually showed films um, by his grandfather. So the name of this uh, old man already at that point was Jean Méliès and uh, his grandfather was Georges Méliès. Um, so when I was about 16, I had this chance of seeing a wonderful collection of hand-colored prints by early uh, trick and animation films by Georges Méliès, one of the great masters of early cinema. And I like to think that, um, now that I think about it after uh, so many years, that this was one of those moments which somehow uh, was kind of decisive in my interest. So uh, from the point of view of my future interest, so like focusing me on ideas which deal with not, not anything, not so much with ma anything mainstream, but so like creative applications of audiovisual media. And probably that part lead, led me then in the 80s to uh, issues around uh, video art, uh, different forms, other forms of, of um, using video, uh, also uh, music videos, about which I did some research a long time ago. And also then in the second half of the, uh, towards the end of the 80s to the field of uh, computer imaging, computers uh, as a potential medium at that time for a new kind of a moving image, image culture. Um, so which is pre pretty much the beginning of my, of one side of my work, which was this activity as a curator and producer of uh, art, artwork, mostly in connection with the computing culture. So it's, it's been one of those, definitely one of those guiding lines uh, during these past 10 years. So I've done uh, 
should I say many, uh, probably many exhibitions. Uh, I think something like 12, 12 to 14 exhibitions in Finland, but also in other, other countries. I did actually one show um, even in, in, uh, in the Los Angeles area in 95, I think, at the art gallery at the uh, Pasadena Art Center Gallery, which was a group show of uh, interactive installation art. And I was also involved with organizing a large-scale festival of uh, uh, new computer, uh, sort of like um, related art for uh, Los Angeles in uh, actually 94 and 95, an event called the Interactive Media Festival, which took place at the Variety Arts in, in downtown Los Angeles. So I was one of the people actually working on that, uh, on that, and uh, realizing that that uh, uh, event. Actually, to as an interesting aside, so maybe I should mention that uh, this event, which took place in 95 was probably the first art event which took simultaneously place in the, in the internet. So using the uh, very earliest uh, versions of the VRML code. So we had a virtual gallery about, the, about what, what was actually to be seen, a virtual kind of like a duplicate, which, which was actually available in the internet at that time and probably was the very first of its kind uh, ever, ever designed. Um, so, beside this activity, and I would actually like to just in a second show you a couple of slides. This is a pretty much a random selection of slides over the years, uh, showing you just a glimpse of, of uh, the work of a couple of artists whose work has been included in these shows that I've, I've curated. Um, I would just like to say before going into that, so that a couple of words about this other side of my activity, which has also always pulled me uh, towards looking at, at questions of media culture uh, also in this historical focus. Trying to understand these things not only uh, in the present but also somehow mirroring them uh, through, through phenomena we find from, uh, from earlier centuries. Um, I'll just show you a couple of images which um, for, have kind of developed have kind of begun, begun kind of key images for my teaching and research over the years. I think this often happens with many people doing the kind of work. So once you're doing research and, and you're entering different fields, so then you find, find yourself in your thoughts and, and very often in your lectures coming back to a certain kind of image which provides a sort of like entry point for you to those fields. And I think this is definitely has been probably the most important key image for my, my research. This is a cartoon from 1911 from the Life magazine, which is not the famous Life, but actually the earlier, earlier magazine with the same name. It's a, it's a cartoon by um, Harry Grant Dart, who actually um, uh, who, um, published quite a few such visions about future. Very often, um, as so much of the scientific, science fiction discourse, um, kind of like situated in a strange temporal dimension between the present and the future, somewhere, somewhere there, um, which shows us a world uh, sort of like inhabited by all these uh, uh, amazing technologies and, and tries to deal with the role of the human in relation to those technologies. Um, I'm not going to go through all these different gadgets uh, we, we see uh, around here, just maybe just pointing out a couple of interesting devices like this thing that uh, this fantasy machine right here, which seems to have a, which is like a, some kind of a personal uh, device into sort of like a television vision device into see, to seeing in, into a distance, which has a, some kind of a customized sort of like bookmarks list, if you want. For, for webcams or whatever you, how you want to take it. So it's kind of fantasy for that kind of a form of uh, communication. At the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a device which uh, obviously has something to do with the technologies of surveillance. So like uh, peeping at people from behind their backs and, and things like that, like that. But actually the things which uh, really um, started interesting me when I first found this image is, image 
um, had to do with the kind of vision about the fate of human, uh, humans on the, in, the, in the era, shall we say, on the era of the integrated media technology. Uh, so the fact um, which, um, so I mean that when we look at the kind of vision, not just this vision, but many other visions from the beginning of the 20th century, we see that obviously the impact of this accumulation of all these fantastic technologies has been a certain kind of like uh, breaking down of the social units, like family type of social unit, which actually uh, puts it into a situation where the communication is actually mediated, taking place by means of these technologies in, in distance and then leaves people alone in their places, surrounded by these sort of like these, these gadgets and things like, like that. We could actually, and I often do in my teaching and writing, contrasting, I often contrast this vision with some of the earlier ideas from the Victorian era, which were kind of reactions to the first um, uh, first media machines ever uh, introduced to the homes, which were devices like the stereoscope or the uh, phonograph uh, in the 1870s, which often showed uh, as a much more positive vision, like these media devices, like surrounding or strengthening these basic social units, uh, still situated in just this one and the same space within the home, often actually around the table or in some cases sitting around the fireplace and things like that. So um, when I started thinking about uh, visual discourses like the one we see here, it was actually almost impossible at that time to come to think about uh, thinkers like, uh, like European apocalyptic media thinkers like Jean Baudrillard, who seem to be claim, claiming that uh, the main impact of this integrated media technology actually basically pretty much taking place in the situation in the 70s and 80s was this fact of like turning the turning uh, private spaces into sort of like satellite spaces and also uh, kind of breaking uh, basic units in, in society uh, culture uh, as an as an kind of um, as a result of the introduction of these technologies and the kind of formation of a kind of a technological zone surrounding these people. So, I mean, I found it interesting that the kind of research, kind of philosophy, which seemed to be talking about the present in the situation, let's say in this 80s or could pretty much be applied to the 90s as well, was possible to find in these popular uh, manifestations like decades, decades earlier. And as I soon found out, actually much earlier than this. Um, so I found ways of, um, as I continued this kind of research, this is by the way, an image um, illustrating the other situation I, I referred to, where you see that the coming of the media technology, which is this simple device for viewing these images seems to uh, according to these visual discourses, seems to have this sort of like unifying effect, like creating harmony. On the other hand, of course, we see a kind of a, like a dreamy-like aspect entering culture, like people spending time together, but at, at the same time somehow probably being immersed in these visual worlds opened up by this media technology you're seeing right there. But I wanted to show you still another image which I personally found interesting when I continued the kind of research that I'm trying to explain. And the kind of image is, is the one here. Like looking at these very early devices, which uh, until recently haven't even been considered worthy of the name of media. Um, they were actually considered, uh, until about maybe 10 years ago, most or less like simple optical toys in the 19th century, which had nothing to do with the kind of functions that media came to serve in the 20th century. 
like the stereo viewer. But if we look at this kind of visual discourses around it, like this is from the 1860s, the beginning uh, around 1860, so it probably shows us certain features of culture which we easily uh, easily identify with much much later stages, like this device entering the home almost like father carrying home the first TV set in the in the maybe in the 1950s. Everybody showing so like being so enthusiastic about it, is actually showing the former forms of pastime, like reading books and things. Then what happens is that this appearance of this device starts breaking the family unit, unit somehow. First, all kind of incidents starts happening. Children get immersed in, 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 in the, this device. And finally, we see this outcome of the in, introduction of the media, which is like a, like a group of wrecks, you know, with, with cross-eyed wrecks, you know, the, the, the kind of lifestyle has been completely ruined by this technology. I mean, I don't think I need to remind anybody, anyone about the kind of uh, pedagogical discourses, ideological discourses around television at the time in the 50s, or re more recently in the context of the internet. But just to, show, just to show you that I became very interested in looking at different manifestations and interpretations of media uh, in the past, also in the context of, of our contemporary notions of that, also in the sense of trying to understand better what's the direction, what's the, the dimension of novelty that's, that's so often tooted by advertisers and people like that. Everything is unheard of in culture, uh, that's kind of things. Now, we, we, have, we find ways of peeling away a lot of this kind of apparent novelty and probably will, it will, I think, give us better understanding about really what's this sort of like the developing, what are the developing layers and features in, in culture in these days. I never wanted to say that, you know, the, I, I never wanted to feel, I, I never felt I'm a nostalgic, so I always wanted to uh, like dive into the past to look at the ways how these let us understand those processes that pretty much active in, in the structures in, in media culture. I, this is a topic that I always get carried with, so it usually, it's, I find it very difficult to stop at some point, so um, somebody should just take away these images from me. But let's say part of my, part of my research um, has been trying to locate forgotten technologies, devices which uh, seem to be completely obsolete, um, that nobody's even talking about, and then trying to understand their role in this general fabric of uh, media culture. One of these devices I encountered, um, and let, let's, I'll let this be the absolutely last example, so because the time is running, was, for instance, this device, which was actually the very first device uh, which mechanized the uh, process of writing. This was Edison's um, invention from the 1870s, which was Edison electric pen and press. Very weird type of uh, media device, using, as you can see, using a very simple sort of like electric uh, battery and a tiny little electric motor in the end of the, end of the, the pen. And now the principle with which this device works is pretty much the same as the sewing machine. So there is actually no, there isn't any ink in the end of the pen. It is just like a puncturing needle. And now, what you do, you actually puncture the secretary. Actually, punctures a paper, which looks pretty much like this. And then this is used with a more traditional, like printing press, like a device to produce copies of that. And Edison actually claimed that up to 4,000 copies could be produced out of each, each matrix, basically, produced with this device here. Now, of course, uh, this is a device which was very widely used in American offices for a while. It was actually became really part of the technological uh, landscape uh, on Wall Street everywhere in the 1870s. And almost, almost as rapidly it was gone. Uh, naturally, it was uh, replaced by devices like the typewriter, which was in introduced just a little bit after, after this device here. 
Now, of course, we understand the, why Edison came up with this idea. Uh, as so often in culture, so the pen, naturally, as the most natural interface for, for writing or drawing was, was the kind of idea which was, is behind it. This is self-evident. On the other hand, Edison was one of the pioneers of electric technology, so he wanted to expand his markets and find new applications for devices like that. On the other hand, I think it's, it's really interesting to try to look at uh, issues around interfacing ideas like using the pen. Um, and then if we look at, once again, media, cultural, material, uh, from such a point of view, I think some of the traditional ideas may uh, kind of like reorganize themselves differently from what we've been thinking about. For instance, thinking about one of the basic apparata of media culture, uh, audiovisual media culture, which is the camera obscura. Uh, which you all know, which is in a sense the uh, uh, preform of, of any, any of the cameras we worked with these days. Um, <clears throat> in one of its early, early functions, uh, it was seen as, a, as an artist's uh, tool. Uh, this is a long story. I, I can't go into this actually here. Uh, something pretty much related with the Renaissance theories of, of perspective at the time in the 17th century and the 18th century, used by artists for producing sketches. Uh, the, the light beams enter through the lens, bounce from the mirror, and end up on this transparent screen right here. But so if we look at devices like this now from a slightly different point of view, thinking about the kind of interfaces, so then we can actually probably see some kind of an interesting uh, uh, connection with this idea and let's say the idea that we just talked about from the uh, 1870s, thinking about the fact that this is another pen-based screen. It's a, it's a screen which we're actually touching with the tip of the pen uh, for, for the purpose of, 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 of sketching, producing an image. Now this is basically simple, of course, but if we think about the kind of situations these days where we communicate with screens by means of touching with some kind of a pointing device and touching it with that, so then I think we come to think about interactive screens. We, we come to think about uh, tablets. I, I've been using a Facom tablet actually instead of a mouse for quite some time. For instance, I found it much more natural actually even for writing and anything. So natural interface than some other things. We could also uh, look at, interestingly, uh, issues like the interplay of this kind of, a, uh, this kind of a interface in history with the other alternative, which is the keyboard-based based idea, which appears, uh, for instance, with, uh, with the typewriter in the uh, late 19th century, and then we could probably also consider devices like that, and I'm just going to show you this image, like some early telegraph devices. This is actually a very widely used form of, of the telegraph, uh, introduced in the 1850s by this guy, this called the so-called Hughes, Hughes ma machine, which was like a way of like playing, as almost like music, playing the messages over distances. Uh, using the kind of piano keyboard. Or we could look at the, anima, uh, the automata tradition, so the early, uh, very early playful um, examples of uh, like playing with this kind of creating like technologies which raise issues around, around media culture, like this writing automata or piano playing automata, things like that. So this is just to give you an idea about the kind of things that I've been trying to explore during the past 10 years. And, and of course you see that the, one of the reasons uh, why, I, why I'm doing this is that I am trying to understand also the contemporary logic of these interfaces. Why do we use certain kind of interfaces to, to connect us with these technologies and the world beyond those? I think that one of the, re one of the ways we can answer is really to look at these, these historical manifestations of those and actually see some kind of a historical fluctuation in these ideas. I think that there are many ideas which are basically there in, in this 
uh, like historical traces we can still find and which we can very interestingly connect with our more recent ideas. And I, I personally li would like to say that I've, I've felt, always felt teaching, actually having a fairly long experience in teaching institutions which have to do with design and media. Uh, University of Art and Design in Helsinki and actually the University of Lapland where I was the chair for um, such a program, actually for a while, like a media studies program. Um, so that I've come to, come to feel that this, this kind of a, approach probably seems to provide a more wider, so like understanding for people trying to cope with certain kind of basic media related design issues. Um, it gives them a sort of like understanding about the background and the cultural sort of like cultural context of the kind of things that they are trying to do. Because I'm, I'm thinking that people are often seem to be sort of like having absolutely no idea about certain kind of functions in their, in their lives and their professional activities. They're just doing things like that. So pretty much all of my, all of my work uh, in some sense over these past 10 years has been uh, about trying to provide these contexts for these young people to make them more conscious about what they are doing, to, uh, give them the possibility of using this incredible richness of, of uh, this historical material, much of which is totally forgotten, to kind of uh, like enrich the kind of things that they are trying to do. So this is pretty much, to put it very, very briefly, what's, what's, a, what's been a sort of like a guiding line in these things. Now, uh, we have a little bit of time uh, let's see quickly, very quickly, those slides uh, that I, can we see the slides quickly? And I'm, I'm just like to, I want to show this very briefly, and then I want to show you a brief fragment of one of my TV series in which I've tried to use the television to actually to uh, visualize some of these ideas that I've been doing. So, okay. This is actually, yeah, thank you. So this is, um, I'm not going to analyze this here. So that I think we have, there are other occasions to talk about this. Just to, just to show you a very random selection of a couple of these artworks uh, that I've been showing in various different kind of exhibition contexts. I could actually add quite a few things like work by Bill Seaman. I didn't have a slide with me. Uh, just this is a Jeffrey Shaw's uh, Classic, I would say almost like a classic installation called Legible City, uh, probably uh, one of the uh, basic works dealing with issues around interactive media and its problematics, so the kind of cycling tour within this virtual city on the, on the screen. Uh, I showed this in, a, in the beginning of the 90s in an interactive art exhibition in, in uh, Helsinki. Uh, this was made, I think, in 89. This is actually one just showing a, another view. Um, there are different, different sort of like virtual cities of letters within these worlds. And while you're sort of cycling through the world here, uh, what you're actually doing is turned into, interestingly, into a process of reading by the fact that you're actually uh, cycling from one sentence to another and also in some sense to, a, to an idea, to a, to idea of act of writing. Because basically being able to choose your roots here, so you're not just reading, but you're leaving a trace behind. It's kind of like conceptual trace of the kind of sentences you went through. In a way, it's also a metaphor for a, for a sort of like multi-dimensional database, of course, language database. And which I think I've been, some of my writings connecting with some ideas about uh, 20s and 30s um, uh, poetry switchers and uh, Dadaist poetry ideas, uh, abandoning uh, the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, syntaxes <coughs> of language and trying to find ways of actually touring inside the language. Uh, there would be much more to say about this, but I will say at some other point. This is just a map for one of those worlds. One of them is actually based on, on the idea of Manhattan. This is a, a, an example of a very early uh, 
interactive installation I showed in the late 80s. Uh, this is Lynn Hirschman's Lorna, which was one of the early uh, pieces using the uh, then new uh, video disc technology. I think Bill Seaman was also experimenting with this at about the same time at MIT. But um, sort of like creating a kind of a personality uh, uh, and a sort of like psychiatric session uh, by means of like uh, using a computer a stack and the uh, uh, the uh, video disc. This is from another Lynn Hirschman video disc called Deep Contact about some erotic narratives also using the same technology from the 80s. I, I showed this in uh, in the beginning of the 90s in one of the big shows in uh, Helsinki. This is another of her work which is like a peep show box uh, again, referring to very early early technologies, which has actually is popping up over and over again as we look at the history of the media culture. What you see inside there, um, how do you sharpen? Okay, let's see. What you see inside there is actually this miniature room, and the eyepiece is a kind of a uh, sort of like visual joystick. So you activate certain parts of the space and what happens is you trigger, I'm sorry these are the wrong way around, trigger video sequences uh, in the back which confront you directly um, which is a very clever interesting way of like uh, criticizing certain like uh, uh, scopic issues which had to do with the traditional tradition of the traditional ideas around the peep show machine which is pretty much a, like voyeuristic situation where you are in, in the power situation of power you are commanding the situation of looking into the visual field where she introduced elements which actually kind of like counter that kind of ideas like this these images challenging you directly or actually or, or your own image as a video loop in the tiny little monitor there. Um, I'm sorry about this. Um, I usually speak at much, much longer about this. This is a very simple example of the work of Perry Holberman, the uh, New York-based artist. It's a, it's a suitcase turned into a kind of a like a strange stereo uh, view. So there's a whole world, illuminated world inside the suitcase. It's called excess luggage. A um, couple of years ago, I uh, curated a large-scale retrospective show of Perry Hoberman, which was seen at the uh, Center for Art and Media Technology in Karlsruhe, Germany, and also in Finland. Uh, and we also produced a, like a large-scale catalog for that. This was actually one of, just one of the pieces in that show. Um, or pieces like uh, Catherine Richards, uh, the virtual body, which I found actually interesting, uh, uh, where she was also dealing with ideas about peeping into boxes, which is a very traditional media form, but actually introducing, uh, criticizing the fact, like introducing the second hole through which you can insert your hand inside the box. So now it means that this means partly I introducing your body into that visual field, which we in traditionally associate as a virtual space, a space which cannot be entered by the body, which can only, only be entered by your, your uh, eye. So she wanted to re-enter and criticize those ideas by interestingly making you see not just the virtual world inside the box, but actually your hand, your hand actually manipulating the image image world in it. Um, and now this is the traditional reference point to those, all those, those works. This is a, uh, an early uh, 18th century peep show machine from, uh, from the collection of the Film Museum in Turin, in, in Italy, which is one of the most wonderful collections in the world. And, uh, and this technology, which has been pretty much forgotten, is quite interestingly kind of being brought back, uh, back to view, let's say, by, by this tradition of these artists. I'm just, that I just showed a couple of examples. On the other hand, uh, the peep show idea 
is something which is pretty much present in the media culture these days. Um, you just think about any of those uh, notorious sex sites on, on the uh, internet and the way how they are designed. The logic you find there where you have to click and click and click, you are kept given all those promises, finally uh, the door closes unless you give your credit card number or whatever. This is exactly the kind of logic which we find from these marketplaces in the 18th century, almost word to word, in the context of, of these, these uh, cultures. Cultures, machines made out of wood, simple paper illusions inside, uh, but, but something which is, is in some very meaningful way, I think, connected with the kind of experiences we encounter on the web these days. Now, I'm just trying to say, and this is the last thing I want to say, that this is the complete explanation for all the questions and problems and issues on the web. It's definitely not. But it's, it's one possible way of approaching and sort of like uh, opening up some of the design issues there from a historical uh, uh, perspective, um, which I, I, I still claim is, is an important, interesting one. This is, by the way, another, another of those wonderful peep show boxes uh, uh, preserved at the Museum of Turin, uh, which is pretty interesting in many ways. For instance, this is for five people, so in a marketplace. It tells you something important about the culture, for instance, in the sense that if you uh, try to accommodate five people in, one, in, in front of this machine, and we have made the experiment in Turin, in Torino, uh, so you, you necessarily are you cheek to cheek. So it's, a, it's, it's something which had to do with the idea of the uh, diseases spreading in culture in the, in the 18th century. Uh, through the marketplaces, encounters of people there, and uh, which somehow affected the bad image of this kind of technology in culture, because it was associated with spreading diseases. And uh, this is exactly the kind of uh, theme which was taken up also, actually, in the case of the very earliest movie theaters in the beginning of the 20th century. People were told not to go because these are places where this is, this is a spread because it brings together people that never ever in their daily lives would, would get so close to each other otherwise. So we can actually find all these explanations and things communicated through this. No, I don't know how this would connect with the idea of like internet peep shows and uh, some kind of cyber diseases spread by those, but I mean that's up to others to think about. Um, and this is actually just a wonderful text in the, in the, in the cover, the original text saying, Instacassella mostro il mondo nuovo con dentro lontananze prospettive voglio un soldo per testa e che lo trovo. Basically saying, in this box I'm showing you the new world. Uh, the distant lands, the perspective views, and I want uh, to have a coin for each, 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 each of, from each of you, things, things like that. I think I will actually, I have a couple of things, but I'll let me, uh, let's stop the slides now. I think this, this is enough to give you an idea about the kind of approaches I have had. So if you, would you, have like a couple of minutes more so that I could send you, show you a little fragment of my, one of my TV works. Because I've, um, I've been very interested in applying uh, all different media into talking about these kind of ideas, to making them public and understandable. So I've never, I was never interested only to publish scientific papers and books. And uh, in a sense, I also see uh, part of my exhibition activity as another medium. So, and television has been another medium for me as well. So I have uh, written and uh, directed a couple of television series, raising issues around media, interfaces, culture, uh, during the 90s. And these have been actually fairly widely shown, uh, not, never in, in the States, but some of them have been shown in, in different countries in Europe. And, um, and I've also uh, written uh, 
like companion books uh, for this. And I think the probably the most ambitious, so I did one in, in Japan in 93, 94 about Japanese media culture. And before that, there was one of which was about virtual reality during these earliest times. It was 91. And then uh, 96, I finished after working for two years or so a uh, fairly ambitious TV series which is called The Archaeology of the Moving Image, which is a kind of a history from a media archaeological point of view, a kind of history of all, of all these audiovisual technologies from the 16th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And, um, and I also wrote a companion book, which is a kind of a history of these technologies. Unfortunately, um, at the moment, only uh, available in Finnish, but uh, but people keep suggesting that I should make a, produce an Eng English version of this. I wouldn't like to. I it's five years, so uh, I should rewrite it completely. But maybe it's an idea. I'll show you just a, a brief sequence from the first first part of this, which deals with the ideas of projection, cultural projection, uh, magic lantern culture and the kind of topics related with that. So let's see this short sequence. Clinton. Camera Obscura, elle apparaît au XIIIe siècle, ce qui est quand même déjà très ancien. Euh, et, mais c'est-à-dire qu'on l'a utilisé au début pour observer des éclipses, etc. C'est à la Renaissance qu'on a commencé à capter, avec cette chambre noire, les images de la vie quotidienne et éventuellement des images même mises en scène. La lanterne magique est venue après, bien sûr, la, la chambre noire, mais on ne sait pas exactement à quelle date. Euh, on sait euh, qu'elle est apparue brusquement, je, je dirais, euh, aux Pays-Bas, euh, entre les mains d'un astronome euh, à l'époque extrêmement réputé, qui s'appelait Christian, Christian Huygens, et euh, Huygens a, en 1659, a dessiné la première plaque connu de lanterne magique. Donc c'est en plus c'était une plaque animée déjà. C'était un squelette qui retirait euh, son crâne et qui le remettait sur ses épaules. C'était une, une une transcription de la danse de mort de Hans Holbein. The lantern, in its long career, went through many phases. Uh, when it began, it was uh, it was uh, the discovery of uh, and, the, and, and the pleasure, the toy of scientists and its first home was in the, the uh, scientific cabinets, the cabinets of curiosities of um, uh, 17th and 18th century savants, uh, along with microscopes and telescopes and other marvels of the age. But uh, it was too amusing to be left just to the, the scholars and the scientists, and it was quickly taken up by showmen. Throughout the uh, 18th century, um, traveling showmen, they would travel with their lanterns on their backs and their boxes of glass slides and perhaps a, a hurdy-gurdy or a, 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 some other form of uh, musical instrument. And they would travel from place to place and they came to a village, they would give shows, um, maybe in, in a barn or if they were very uh, lucky they might get into the drawing room of the grand house. Je pense qu'au XVIIIe siècle, le, les colporteurs de lanternes magiques ou de boîtes optiques étaient beaucoup des les, les médias ambulants du siècle. Les gens n'avaient pas évidemment de, de, de radio, de télévision, les journaux n'arrivaient pas dans les campagnes. Et le colporteur qui allait de village en village avec soit sa lanterne magique et ses plaques, soit ses vues d'optique dans ses dans ces boîtes optiques, permettait de raconter à toute la campagne, à tous les gens reculés, ce qui pouvait se passer à la cour, ce qui pouvait se passer dans le monde, euh, pouvait leur montrer des monuments de, 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 des grandes villes d'Europe. Et c'était vraiment un média important de, pour le peuple. La fantasmagorie est apparue à la fin du XVIIIe siècle, sous la Révolution française. Euh, à travers un homme qui s'appelait Robertson, 
il a créé des plaques de lanterne magique qui étaient euh, très inquiétantes, qui étaient à base de squelettes, à base de revenants, à base de, de, de fantômes. Euh, il a utilisé, alors que Lucet et Marie-Antoinette venaient d'être guillotinés quelques années avant, il a, ainsi que d'autres révolutionnaires comme Danton en Espierre, il projetait dans un endroit un peu inquiétant, dans un, dans, un, dans un couvent, avec des lanternes magiques qui, pour la première fois, étaient mobiles. Un, un Français, en parlant de la lanterne de Huygens, a dit « c'est la lanterne de peur ». Ça dit bien, ça désigne exactement ce que euh, représentait la lanterne magique aux yeux des gens qui n'arrivaient pas à s'expliquer la façon dont elle marchait. La fantasmagorie est revenue comme ça et, et, et pour évoquer les morts, pour faire peur, à une époque vraiment euh, scientifique, à une époque sensée. Donc ça, c'est encore un paradoxe assez intéressant. Euh, on a longtemps cru que la fantasmagorie avait été inventée par euh, Étienne Gaspard Robert, dit Robertson. Euh, en fait, il n'en est absolument rien. Robertson a été euh, une sorte de semi-charlatan, de voleur. Euh, il a emprunté tous les procédés. À, euh, à des personnages qui, bien avant lui, avaient déjà mis en œuvre le spectacle de Fantasmagorie. Alors, le spectacle de Fantasmagorie, c'est euh, avant tout, c'est la rétro-projection. C'est-à-dire qu'on ne voit pas la lanterne magique, elle est cachée derrière l'écran, et les images deviennent euh, véritablement mobiles et animées. Elles sont animées par toujours les mouvements classiques, euh, comme pour la plaque de Huygens, mais les images euh, évoluent, deviennent de plus en plus grandes ou de plus en plus petites, etc., puisque la lanterne fantascope est montée sur des rails. Alors là, vous avez une, une lanterne de fantasmagorie qui date des années 1840-50, qui rentre entièrement dans cette boîte, quand la démontre objectif étant très lourd et soutenue par ce berceau en bois, et vous avez la possibilité soit de passer des plaques, toujours évidemment avec des têtes un peu grotesques, avec des, des... donc de passer des plaques soit horizontalement, donc comme beaucoup de lanternes, avec l'objectif devant, soit vous pouvez passer, ce qui est beaucoup plus rare, des plaques verticalement, et qui rentrent de cette façon-là, dans la lanterne magique. Et donc elle passe de cette façon-là. Et vous avez bien évidemment, comme sur toute lanterne de fantasmagorie, la manivelle pour l'éloignement ou le rapprochement et la ficelle pour l'œil de chat dans l'objectif. Et tout ça a fait un spectacle qui a connu un succès immense très rapidement qui a été copié, bien évidemment, comme tout ce qui, ce qui marche. Et jusqu'aux années euh, 1810-1815, des spectacles de fantasmagorie ont tourné comme ça, à Paris, et puis euh, après en province, ou même à l'étranger. Et on trouve d'ailleurs des, des, des objets, et des lanternes de fantasmagorie sur les catalogues jusqu'aux alentours de 1840-50 à peu près. Ce qui prouve qu'il devait encore y avoir des spectacles dans ces eaux-là. Pendant tout le 19e siècle, on a toujours exploité la veine de la fantasmagorie, des projections diaboliques, etc. Et c'est vrai que dès l'apparition du cinéma, finalement, on assiste encore à des résurgences de la fantasmagorie. Euh, Emile Cole va réaliser un film qui s'appelle Fantasmagorie. Euh, les Anglais vont réaliser des films, euh, des, des, des skeleton dances, ou euh, des choses comme ça, où on voit des petits squelettes qui dansent, etc. Euh, toujours dans la, dans la tradition, finalement, euh, euh, qu'on qu peut, euh, que, que, que Huygens a débuté, a commencé. Poi, appunto, c'è stato l'abate Nollet che ha pensato ma perché non utilizzare la lanterna magica non solo a scopo di divertimento per far vedere paesaggi, scene. So I think we probably wouldn't have, have more time actually to continue with this, but uh, when uh, this was actually in some sense it was a uh, strange one-man television within the uh, framework of a big TV, TV company. So um, 
I um, wrote a script. Um, I uh, directed it. I went around the crew. Um, this was shot in Italy, England, Germany, France, Holland, this whole series. Nothing in Finland. <laughs> There's nothing. And um, so went, went, through, went, 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 went through for actually for quite a few shooting days. And uh, then basically even the visual, I, I did the editing. So took the whole editing together with, the, of course, with the online editor. And, uh, and even designing the gra graphic, graphic uh, sort of like nature of, of the work. And I wanted to, I was actually very ambitious with this series. So I, I wanted it to be, in some sense, very concrete. So it has to be able to, to tell the visitors really about how these, many, many cases, forgotten technologies worked. I wanted it to make extremely sort of like clear. At the same time, I, I tried to speak about the culture, these cultural connections behind all these, all these things. Whether it succeeded, I, I don't know. But anyway, so that was the, I tried to balance between this concreteness and the kind of general vision of, of, of culture. So this is in actually one and a half hours altogether. And I'm, I'm thinking about uh, trying to somehow do it again. So like actually to make a one or two parts more as I learned so many things after, after I realized this series. So I think this is pretty much it. So that I'm working on a new uh, TV idea, which is, would be pretty much be about sort of like a uh, mental cultural history of the early computing. Uh, it's actually a jump to a slightly different direction. So using a lot of archival footage from the 50s and 60s about how the computer was received in culture, uh, which is amazingly pretty much unexplored area. So we have some books about now about the, the history of the computing hardware and software. But we have very few explanations and understanding about the role of the culture in popular imaginations, people's minds, and things. So I've been working. I've actually submitted a script for this, this thing. Let's see if at some point in the distant future I would get some the production budget together. But I think it's also something which might be, might be needed. So uh, maybe that could be some future. TV work. Um, but other research interests I have now is that I think that uh, probably I've come to a point where I should uh, gather together all this research that's been published in different sources. Uh, that's at least the uh, impact I get from the feedback I get from people. So I think it's probably time to uh, produced a book on media archaeology, which bringing all these things together. And the other thing I think should be a kind of like a book about the history of interactive art, which really doesn't exist either. So also connecting that with like pre-digital uh, ideas on the field of, uh, 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 on this field, which I touched upon a little bit in this, in this lecture. I think those two books are probably the most urgent ones to write, and I, I think I, I, I probably should, I mean, when it comes to writing, so I should concentrate on those, to get those two, two things done. Uh, I think this is probably all I, I may have forgotten something. of these devices and you spend a lot of time in how they work and, and the design of the yeah. hardware in a, in a sense. And then I guess I understand the curating side is the interest in the content. Yes, the, I, I think it's, it's probably, I, I, I wouldn't say these are so separate from each other, but uh -huh. I mean, I definitely think that, uh, I mean that 
as I think was clear, I'm very interested in, uh, always be very interested in the discourses surrounding technology. I, I don't see technologies like hardware or software as separate from these cultural contexts ever surrounding them. And so that it might be my great interest to try to understand this cultural context, the kind of visions and uh, fears, sometimes some hopes and all, whatever, all kinds of uh, like ideas people attach to these technologies and which surround them in culture. This is definitely one. But I also think that it's very important to look closely at, at certain features of these technologies themselves. Because I think that these technologies it, in themselves are like design, like design solutions. If you think about interfaces or, or the ways these things function, they tell us much about this culture as, as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we should focus on those things as well. So I think that in some sense we can also, this is a little, this is debatable actually, in some sense we can also look at that kind of design solutions in those machines themselves as kind of discourses. It's a kind of a statement about how certain things function. And very often certain features of these technologies, if we just think about the hardware, pretty much affect the aesthetics and the nature of the spectacle mm -hmm. and then also the nature of this impact it has in, in society. We can think about simple pieces of technology like the Lumiere cinematograph, the, one of the first movie cameras, for instance, uh, which was directly connected with the kind of aesthetics uh, produced in the, for those early movie audiences by the fact that it, it had no viewfinder. Uh, you had no ways of moving it. After, so you had to actually to set it up through looking through the lens, put the film inside, close it. And uh, you had no way of actually panning with the camera. That's one of the reasons why all the, all the early films contain no film movements. So it's, it's partly the function of the technology. Yeah. At the same time, it of course has to, has to do with the fact that the model in people's minds was photography. And photography always, I mean, one of the things which is naturally connected with that is that the camera by any means shouldn't move. You have to keep the camera stable. So that's kind of thinking uh, like came over from the field of photography to the early moving image culture. And it took a while until this technology changed and people's aesthetics changed and, and made the camera mobile. And as a curator, your interest is in looking at, art, is it in general looking at artists that are working with new media technologies or do you find yourself drawn to certain types of areas of art? No, actually, uh, this was a very, unfortunately, very uh, narrow, <laughs> narrow uh, selection of, of, of work. So, um, I'm, and this was pretty much, um, I, I, can, I can confess that I had this because this had to do with uh, some of the classes I'm doing, so yeah. this media, with these media archaeological connections. But I, I definitely wouldn't say that I'm I'm only showing work which, which deals with these ideas. I'm, I'm definitely interested in all kinds of th different kinds of approaches. But I mean that I'm... But all relating to media and somehow? Um, you mean that if we... So that this leads us to the I mean, complicated question. What do you mean? What, do, what we mean by media? Are you, so. As a curator, are you looking at art... Are you kind of looking at the latest trend, like, you know, now internet and art seems to be such an interest, so do you feel that it's your responsibility no, to I don't, look at um, that? I think there are many people trying to do it, so uh, there are many people running after fashion, so to say. I don't, I'm not interested in that, so I, I'm much more interested in taking, so like more conceptual approach, taking certain ideas which I think probably artists have been, have been uh, raising, and uh, then in and using that as a guiding line in, a, in the exhibition. I, I don't want to do things like interactive, exhibitions of interactive arts, something like that ever again. I did several of those in the times when this technology was new and sort of like upcoming and it was kind of interesting, but I, I think it's now it's, it's around, it's very widely, widely used. I think it's much more to my interesting to adapt the sort of like conceptual content oriented point of view uh, for for curating, so I I did it myself, you know, but I wouldn't like to do it again, and uh, and uh, so this is this is the direction.
but I mean that they, this means that it, it, this kind of approach can accommodate very many different kinds of ways of using artistic means. And like already in the most recent one uh, I curated, I have all kinds of things like starting from mosaic works, pieces which are traditional floor mosaics. Uh, directly it has nothing to do with the computer, but if you start thinking about all the connections, and for instance in the context of that particular piece, it's, it's pretty much about contemporary culture, it's pretty much about media, at the same time, it makes this, all these cultural references all the way back to the imperial palaces in ancient Rome or, or early Christian churches. It's actually a floor mosaic showing a giant image of Lara Croft, the uh, computer, computer image, uh, computer game uh, heroine these days. Of course, the idea of mosaic is all, always direct, directly associated with the pixel image, uh, the nature of the computer image and all that kind of things. So I, I wouldn't like to, uh, at least anymore, use a certain technology, technological tool as the deciding factor for any exhibition I do. I think it should be subordinated to the, to the ideas and concepts. Can you talk a little bit about the shifting relationship between artists and curators? Or if you see a it's relationship a shifting. Yeah. I mean, this whole question that, as far as I know, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be something like uh, the theory of the curator. It's also interesting that uh, if one looks at some of these uh, more serious analyses about the systems of the art world, you know, the, what are the decisive uh, relationships bit w within, within the art world, and that are naturally interacting with each other. I'm thinking about some writings by Marta Rosler, for instance, uh, her like late 70s and 80s writings where, where she tried to look at all these different factors like gallery, critic, uh, whatever. So um, actually the curator wasn't part of that, that thinking, which is in itself, I think it's quite interesting. So I think that the, it seems to me that the role, first of all, that the role of the curator which is, of course, comes from the curator, it's a keeper of collections in uh, traditional museums, is has actually undergone some changes recently. I think you are right. Now, it's also interesting to think about this question that you just made. So how, how do the curators relate to the artists themselves? How do they see themselves? And how this relationship between these have been, has been shifting? So. I can probably only answer, and I'll try to answer just briefly from my own personal point of view. I, I personally feel that on this field, uh, the role of the curator somehow uh, has, at least in some cases, seemed to at some... First of all, it it's partly resembles something which could be labeled as producer, partly. So producing work, helping sometimes fund work, uh, so maybe some, somehow commenting on the, on the progress of the work and things like that. I have, I've been a couple of times in such role, uh, some work by Paul Sermon, these telematic installations we did in Finland, for instance, were pretty much about that, finding possibilities for actually doing it by talking to institutions like the Finnish Telecom. These were the pioneer, some pioneering uh, telematic work using, uh, using uh, basically teleconferencing units and ISDN lines, uh, telematic dreaming, telematic seance, that kind of works by Paul Sermon we did in Finland in the beginning of the 90s and which then became a kind of classics, uh, <laughs> classics like this. Anyway, so, so it was pretty much like a pro producing, helping produce this work. But on the other hand, so it's, it's hard, to, hard to actually avoid the impression that the kind of idea of like a secondary creator or help, helping creator is, is pretty, it's, it's also, also sometimes there. Um, I've been working in such a way with some artists, which means that there's a very close collaboration so that uh, there are ideas, uh, they come, come up with ideas or sketches, uh, or sketches and videos and files in computer. They send me those files. 
I look at them, I comment on them, I, I criticize them, I send them back. Uh, they send me something again. So it's, uh, it's, I wouldn't say that my role as a curator is very decisive in that, that kind of works, but it definitely has some kind of a role uh, in the final outcome of the work. And I think that I, I seem to have, I noticed that I have been moving more and more towards this, to this direction. I also feel strongly that uh, the role of the curator on the field of like media art should not just be somebody selecting work, pre-existing work that's already there. It's much more interesting and challenging to try to help people create new work. And I think this is pretty much the role, uh, I think, that the Contempor Museum of Contemporary Art uh, these as an institution also should adapt and is partly adapting also these days. Then, of course, it's most clearly uh, visible on the field of like web art where some Museums have actually invested a lot on that. But I mean that like museums like Kiasma, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, with which I've been working quite a lot, is, is pretty much uh, even equipped uh, for this active role. So they have very good production facilities at the museum. And these are made available for artists to create projects for the museum. So very good digital editing and image processing uh, suites and things like that. I don't know if it's an answer. It's a, it's a very important and uh, complex question, and uh, I really think that it hasn't been raised often enough these days, so it sh should be, should, one should talk much more about that. that. And I'm not quite sure if I have uh, very clear ideas myself, so maybe I should try to write something about this uh, problematics. Well, I think collaboration Artists work collaboratively, and then mm. the curator assumes a role in that when they're mm -hmm. part of the process. So a lot of the problem arises when mm. people come in and want a finished piece and put it out of context. Yeah, and, and it's, I think it's it's emphasized when when you deal with work which deals with these all these technological means. I mean that it's it's much more understandable when you are doing a painting. It's it's pretty much unless you want to do a panorama, so that it's pretty much like, or a 16th chapel or something, so then it's, it's what you do alone, but it's, I don't know, it seems to be that it's more natural that, to see it more like a collaborative action somehow, activity. We're actually, we're coming to the end, you know, a little bit over uh -huh, the Okay. You kind of a, you think of yourself as a, a bridge between design and a, and media. Sorry? Your interest in media, you know, media arts and, and design, do you consider yourself a kind of a bridge? Uh, good question. Um, I, th I would say that, um, as, you, as you can see very clearly, hopefully from my presentation as well, so I, I'm, I'm not a sort of like a, a traditional curator person or, or a critic, so in the sense that uh, working with media art has always been just a, I mean, it's important, but it's, it's one aspect of my, of my uh, work. Much of my work, realized work, is basically outside that, that, that field, I, so like in the narrow, narrow sense. And I think that the, so like questions around, inter, I can answer, answer to your question from a couple of, points of view. So and first of all, I think there are issues that have been very important for me, which bridge really uh, fields like design and, uh, and, and media art. For instance, this whole question about the interfaces, the nat nature of the interface, how do we communicate with these devices, what's our relationship to each, what, what kind of balance are we trying to create between these things? I think it's a, it's a kind of problem, question which is, is important both in the art context and in the context of uh, designing other, other kinds of uh, media, media ex experiences. So it's something we encounter in, in daily lives, which is pretty much something which has to do with like games, culture these days, which is so powerful, and getting more, more and more powerful. And in some other aspect, it's also naturally something that artists are dealing with. So I think in that sense, 
is probably bridges. And my interest pretty much bridge, well, as you suggest, so bridge uh, these two, two, two fields or approaches. Also, uh, I've been very interested in uh, always uh, in popular, popular cultural forms. I, I must say that I don't feel, and, and I say it frankly, I don't feel pretty much affinity with sort of like old, old style high culture. You know, like I don't feel I belong to the world of like classical high culture, even though, of course, it's important to know about that. I understand much more the logic of this new popular media culture. This is, uh, frankly, this is the way I feel about it. When I was young, I played uh, rock and roll in, uh, in a group that uh, uh, got a recording contract, and we did. Uh, we were playing in in in, in tours, and uh, and I was dealing much with uh, like uh, comic art, comic strips. In the, when I was young, I did uh, even a book about theory, some kind of theories about uh, comic, analyzing like graphic art, comic strips. And uh, when I was a young student of art history, I, uh, I uh, produced, um, actually my very first published uh, sort of like scientific work, which is, uh, was, was focused on, on uh, pop art, looking at the transformation process in Roy Lichtenstein's early 60s work from those uh, from the comic strip frames that he used as a background for his comics paintings uh, from a semiotic point of view. And this was this got published in, the, in, a, in a scientific kind of magazine, uh, journal in the early 80s, and it's the number one uh, in my, my official list of publications. So, sorry? No, that was actually in Finnish at that point. So it was a long time ago. I was a young, ambitious student who was very proud of having my work published. <laughs> so, but anyway, just to give an idea that I was always very interested in the interconnections between uh, popular culture, cultural forms, and then what was also happening on the field of field of art. So it was very, at that point, it was very natural for me to be very interested in like things like pop art uh, at that point. I had a great professor uh, who, unfortunately, is dead now. He was a, one of the best students of Cambridge, and uh, and he gave me a lot about field of like uh, sort of like semiotic analysis of visual culture, which is pretty much a theoretical, great, strong influence on me at that that point. <laughs>